Chapter 4, Section 5. This is about lipids. Lipids are actually an incredibly diverse group of molecules. Lipids are a very diverse group of molecules. They're composed mostly of carbon and hydrogen, and they include things like oils, which you would see in olive oil, and also the more familiar fats, like you would get from bacon grease. They also include waxes. So if you've ever seen like candles or beeswax or even crayons, those are also lipids as well. Lipids also include steroids like testosterone and estrogen. This is little Jimmy from South Park. He's on steroids in the episode Up the Down Steroid. And they also include something called a phospholipid. So phospholipids are basically a lipid. You can see they've got the fatty acid and the glycerol with a phosphate group attached to them. And these are important for our cellular membranes. And in fact, every single cell on the planet is surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. The bilayer part means it's got two layers. We'll talk more about that later. Triglycerides are fats. If you've ever gone to the doctor's office and had your blood work done, one of the things they give you is triglycerides. And basically triglycerides are formed from a glycerol. That's at the very top. There's three carbons with the oxygens hanging down. And they link those to three fatty acids. And those three fatty acids are the chains coming down. Hence the name triglyceride. Let's take a closer look at the fatty acids here. This is an individual fatty acid. Now at the top you should recognize that carboxyl group, but let's take a look at the rest of the molecule. We know it's mostly hydrophobic with nonpolar covalent bonds. So what else do we know about this molecule? Well zooming in right there, you see all those squiggly lines where each little point there, that would represent a carbon atom. And then attached to each carbon atom through a covalent bond are two hydrogen atoms. And remember, carbon and hydrogen have roughly the same electronegativity, so therefore these are nonpolar covalent bonds and the fatty acid doesn't mix in water very well. Now energy is stored in covalent bonds. And here's how it's stored. Energy is stored in covalent bonds. And recall, Covalent bonds are created by the sharing of electrons. And it turns out that electrons have more energy the further away they are from a nucleus. So when you have nonpolar covalent bonds, the electrons are being shared equally between the two nuclei of two different atoms. So between carbon and hydrogen, when they're covalently bonded, those bonds have lots of potential energy. This is different whenever you're covalently bonding oxygen to hydrogen or oxygen to carbon. These are polar covalent bonds. In this case, the oxygen is way more electronegative, so it pulls those electrons in, and as a result, it holds those electrons more, so it has less potential energy. We're familiar with this on an everyday basis. Whenever you look at natural gas, natural gas is basically a lot of carbon and hydrogen. That's why we call it hydrocarbons. You take a match to natural gas or gasoline, and that's enough energy to immediately break those bonds and form carbon dioxide and water. And it's easy to break those bonds because they have a lot of potential energy in them. In contrast, water actually has very little potential energy. And the reason why is when oxygen is covalently bonded to hydrogen, the oxygen is much more electronegative. So it's holding onto those electrons very tightly. So when you throw a match into water, the match simply goes out. And the reason why is because the match does not have enough energy to break the covalent bonds holding water together. Okay, you probably have heard of different types of fats, good fats, bad fats, essential fats. Well, there's a reason. All fats are not the same. There's the good. These are the unsaturated fats. There's the bad. Those are your saturated fats. And we have the ugly, which are the trans fats. Okay, so unsaturated fats, they are healthy and you get these from olive oil, and you get them from mixed nuts. Those are great sources of unsaturated fats, and a couple of them are actually required in our diet. So, what do the unsaturated fats mean? Well, it turns out that they have double covalent bonds. Now, because they have double covalent bonds, if you take a closer look there, you realize that they are not saturated in hydrogen. So whenever you have a double bond, you're actually losing two hydrogens. And that's important for two different reasons. One, as long as you have less carbon and hydrogen, you have less energy. 
But most importantly, if you notice on that triglyceride on the right, those tails are differently shaped. And that's really important. By changing the shape of those tails, unsaturated fats, they're not able to stack very well and they don't form plaques inside of your body. Essential fats are things like omega-3s and omega-6s. They're required for our cells to function. However, we can't make them. So, like essential fatty acids, essential amino acids, and essential vitamins, we must get them through our diet. The term omega-3 and omega-6s comes from you know, alpha and omega. Omega is the last. So when you look at those long chains of fatty acids there, the very last one, if you were to count one, two, three carbons up, that'd be an omega-3. And on the right side, if you were to count six carbons up, you would find your double bond, and that would be an omega-6. The bad. These are your saturated fats, and they are generally considered to be unhealthy. So when you go eat your burger and pizza and french fries and donuts, you get lots of saturated fats. So what does a saturated fat mean? Saturated fats are saturated in hydrogen. That means they have the most amount of hydrogen available, which also means that they're saturated in energy as well. Now here's a difference. If you notice, those long chains are straight. Now that's very different when we saw the unsaturated fats where they were bent. Saturated fats are flat. That means that they can stack on top of each other. In contrast, unsaturated fats are bent and they don't stack. What that means is you can get a lot more saturated fats in one area and it also makes them solid at room temperature. Unlike saturated fats that are bent, they're liquid at room temperature like olive oil. You can think of it like your book as well. It's got about 300 pages in it. All those pages are flat, like a saturated fat, and they stick together very nicely. They can actually stack up on one another. The other thing also, whenever you're going to go make a fire, you don't just put all the newspaper underneath there without wadding it up first. Here's why this is also important. Saturated fats will stack together, but it also gets it harder for our enzymes to break them down. Likewise, if you have your book with all 300 pages in it, if you took a match to it, you'd be hard pressed to light it on fire. However, if you take all the pages out, wad them up, and then uh, try to light it, it's much easier. So unsaturated fats, not only do they contain less energy, they're also easier for our enzymes to break down. And because of their wrinkled nature, that's why they're liquid at room temperature. Now let's get back to our saturated fats. These things are flat and they stack. And where do they stack specifically? In your arteries and they lead to coronary artery disease. That's why you don't want a lot of saturated fats in your diet. And now for the trans fats. These are bad. There is no reason to have trans fats in your diet. And in fact, you want to not have them at all. I've rarely said don't eat anything. This is one thing you want to avoid. And you get these from hydrogenated vegetable oil and margarine and other processed food. Here's a problem. Trans fats might be unsaturated, but look at the shape of that fatty acid tail on the right. It's linear. It's straight. They look like a saturated fat. Now here's a kicker. Two double bonds are harder than break than a single bond. So as a result, trans fats also look like saturated fats and they're harder to break down for your body. So they're a real problem for people having, uh, for causing heart disease. Okay, next thing. Let's talk about cellular membranes. Every single cell on this planet is surrounded by a membrane. And in fact, when we start talking about organelles inside of our cells, those membrane-bound organelles also have cellular membranes. And they're all made up of something called a phospholipid. And if you look, you'll see there's a phosphate group in your fatty acid tails. And one thing you should realize looking at that phosphate group at the top, it is hydrophilic whereas the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. That means that the outside of a membrane is actually hydrophilic and easily interacts with water, and they turn around to the inside, forcing the fatty acid tails inside the membrane, and so the interior is hydrophobic. Here's another example of a cellular membrane. They're very complex. If I were to take a cellular membrane and separate it out by the phospholipids and the proteins, by weight, 
A cellular membrane is 50% proteins. Other groups of lipids include sterols, which include the cholesterol, estrogen, and testosterone. Now they look very different from other things we've been looking at, especially the triglycerides, but they are also mostly carbon and hydrogen. Now estrogen and testosterone are types of signaling molecules. They're also a steroid. If you take lots of testosterone, you're gonna get a lot bigger. Like these guys here, they're part of our anabolic steroids. You probably have heard the word anabolic. Anabolic means building. Whenever you get your blood checked, they often check for your triglycerides and your cholesterol. And they give you something back about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Well, it turns out that there's really no such thing as good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. But let's back up here and talk about this cholesterol molecule. Every single cell in your body has cholesterol in it. It's made from your liver. So it has to be transported from your liver to your cells and then from your cells back to your liver. But if you look at that molecule, you should notice quickly that it is hydrophobic. So the question is, how do you move a hydrophobic molecule throughout your body that's mostly water? To move cholesterol throughout your body, we actually use a molecule called lipoproteins. These are proteins that have some hydrophilic part that can interact with your blood, and especially the water in your blood, and with the cholesterol to move them throughout your body. And there's several different types, but broadly speaking, there's LDL, which is your low-density lipoprotein, and there's your HDL, which is your high-density lipoprotein. Let's begin with the LDLs, our low-density lipoprotein. These are what we call the bad cholesterol, and they're associated with increased risk of heart disease and poor lifestyle. So if you're not exercising and eating a lot of crappy food, like hamburgers, french fries, pizza, and other processed foods, you're gonna have higher LDL levels. And like I said, these are associated with people that are often obese and have more risk of heart attacks. And basically, they just don't live as long. The HDLs are the high density lipoproteins. In general, we call these the good cholesterol. And they're associated with a decreased risk in heart disease and healthier lifestyles. So people with higher HDLs often have more plant-based diets and they're exercising more. And typically people with higher HDL levels, they have lower heart disease rates, lower rates of um, heart attack, and they live longer.